<laughs> you know, I don't get a whole lot of reactions from my sermons because I pretty much say the same thing every week. But for some reason, during the week, when I talked to some of you on the phone or ran into you during the week, you said, hey, Rev, you know, we all have a story. And because that was the line of last Sunday. And I've been thinking about that a lot. I had a wedding yesterday. It was a, a wonderful young couple. They, uh, the bride teaches in elementary school. The groom works at Stag High School. And not only were the two couple nice, neat people, but the bride's mom, who used to work in the school where Quentin went, she's going through chemo for the second time for breast cancer. And the groom, his mom died unexpectedly last February. And when stuff like that happens, there's uh, some extra intensity when you get together to share a moment like a wedding. Uh, it, it adds a kind of a depth and a spirit to it. And it doesn't necessarily make it better because it's kind of sad, but there's just a feeling in the air. And they need to be reminded that even though these people may not be there, they're still very much a part of the wedding. And then the ring bearer is a cute little guy in a tuxedo. And he's supposed to come up the aisle with the rings, and he sprints up the aisle. And his dad's in the wedding party, he sprints up the aisle, he leaps into his father's arms and stays there for the whole service. It was just a beautiful, childlike moment. And I was thinking, there's the bride's mom with a new hair piece. She said, I will not. I have to have hair for her wedding. And there's the groom's dad clutching a rose in memory of his wife. And this little kid safely in his father's arms as a part of the wedding party. And I'm thinking about what we talked about last Sunday, that everybody has a story. And you bring your story and your journey into this place on Sunday morning. And when you go to your kid's wedding or you go to a funeral for somebody you love, and whether you come here on a Sunday morning, you bring all the good stuff and the bad stuff and the gunk that's in your guts with you. It's a part of who you are today. For some reason, I'm not sure if it's the news or some of the things that have happened, I can't get kids out of my mind. Our kids, your kids, kids who are strangers. You know, kids have no say as to when they're born or to where they're born or to whom they're born. I mean, kids just come into the world wherever they are, and they kind of open their eyes and go, wow, this is life. You know, I, like many of you, was lucky. I was born into a home of loving parents, where I was allowed to be free. <laughs> I was allowed to play <laughs> and dance. And so I just think of that song, Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in his bosom gather, nestling bird nor star in heaven, such F refuge ere was given. I guess that's why last weekend, seeing that young boy and his mom sitting on the lawn by Trader Joe's asking for help really bothers me. Somehow I want to take his family and all of his relatives, and all of his friends, and simply say, this kid is innocent. Let's all do what we can to make his life as good and as carefree as possible. He's just a kid, and somehow we're bound together by the power and the beauty of the human spirit. And I want to say to everyone like you would, to everyone who's tempted to harm somebody or to walk the other way or to abandon somebody, Give this kid a chance to dream and to be free and to dance to the music of God's presence. Every child deserves a chance to dream and to hope and to be safe and to go to school and to be in church, to listen to the pastor's dumb stories, to just be the very, very best they can be. My guess is that every one of us here has moments in our life that kind of help us understand what's important and what's not. Maybe moments that you look back on when you, you know, when, once in a while when I get really selfish or really stupid, 
when sometimes I let the gunk in life get in the way of what life is all about, I have to look back on a couple of signature moments that teach me what's important and what's not. At the second service, Crystal is going to be here. And Crystal lives at Heartland Children's Home in Bernie, Texas. She's now 33 years old. And she went there as an abused child at the age of three. It was 25 years ago that we went to Heartland for the first time with nine girls from the church. And we went there, and all it was at that time was a double-wide trailer on 18 acres of farmland. And that's where I met Brad. Brad is a, was a shaken baby. And so he just laid in his crib and laid in his crib day after day after day. And all I would do every morning was go into his little room and I'd pick him up and I'd hold him on my lap and I'd look into his eyes and I would say, Brad, can you see me? Are you wondering? Are you happy or sad? But you don't know because he just didn't move. And that's where he lived. And when he died, I flew out to Heartland to do his funeral. And Brad taught me, without ever, ever saying a word, what life is all about. It's precious. It's unfair at times. It's majestic at times. But life is what it is. And whenever I get worried about not having something or not getting things my way, all I can do is see Brad. And Brad makes me understand there is a heaven. And someday I want to go to heaven and see Brad walking tall and seeing how things are going for him. But Brad was a rabbi and a teacher. On the other end of the spectrum, tomorrow Dr. Tom Reagan is going to be laid to rest. And he was a very humble and gentle man. And I have a lot of his artwork in my body, a couple of hips and a knee. And it wasn't too long after I got my knee that I had to get my hip done. In fact, a lot of you almost forced me to because you said, Don, you're limping so bad, you're making me limp. Would you please do something about it? And so I told my insurance company about it, and they came back and said it's a pre-existing condition. Well, life is a pre-existing condition. I'm a pre-existing condition. Well, anyway, they wouldn't cover it, but I did talk to the hospital and talk to the doctors and said I would pay for it, and don't worry about it, you'll get your money. But when I got my explanation of benefits, I saw how much it cost, and I wrote a check to Dr. Regan for the surgery. A couple weeks later, <laughs> I get a, something back from his office. Uh oh, what did I do wrong now? Opened the envelope, and there was my check, and it was cut in half. I called him on the phone, and I said, Dr. Regan, you can't do that. And he said, yes, I can. And I said, you don't have to do that. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, Don, it's fun in life to do things that you don't have to do. I've never forgotten that. It fuels my fire every single day. I know it fuels your fire because it's about what life is, giving unto others. So Brad and Tom are a tag team of goodness. Dr. Regan, the good Catholic. Brad, Lutheran by default. And you know, little kids... They don't care what religion they are. They just want to see ordinary moments and ordinary miracles laced with goodness and love. It's why we're here. It's who we are. And it's where Jesus lives every day. Amen. If you're able to, please rise for the creed. It's on page 105.